And maybe we'll try it this way. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. That's the energy that we need going into this presentation with our students present, which I'm really excited. I know this is day two of the actual summit, the Student Success Summit. And we've been talking about centering the student voice in our conversations. And we really want to make sure that we are doing that while we are obviously talking about different strategies and things that we're putting in place. So I'm delighted not only to introduce myself, but to just introduce the concept of this session, right? So my name is Ashley Prelo. I'm Assistant Vice President of Student Success, Retention, and Student Thriving. And I just wanted to say that I'm, this is my favorite presentation. I've only been here a year and a half. <laughs> and it's because uh, last time when we did this, again, we bring in the student voices. We talk about the landscape of our student body, right? To give you all a sense of what they're looking like, where they're coming from, and then what are they doing when they come to campus? How are they performing? How are they behaving? So we're gonna get into all the specifics there and then save the best for last so you can hear directly from our students. I'm gonna introduce and turn it over to Jeremy. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's so nice to have you all here. Uh, my name is Jeremy Lowe. I'm the Assistant Vice Provost for Undergraduate Admissions. And I always think a great place to start when we're about to begin a new academic year is to talk about the students we can expect to support and welcome over the coming weeks months and the entire academic year. Now, our team has been working with the with these students for the last, last 12 to 15 months. We've cultivated a relationship with them. We've shared with them the AU story of what our community is all about. And now we're about to realize that vision for them when we welcome them to campus this coming weekend for new student move-in, all the great activities that are happening around, happening around Welcome Week, and the orientation period, and then the, the start of classes. So I have the distinct privilege of telling you a little bit more about our, um, our students and you know who you can expect to work with, to welcome, to teach uh, over, the, over the coming academic year. Um, so I think it's, it's great to, to look at this in the big picture. So where, where are we at in terms of the size of incoming, the incoming class relative to the rest of the undergraduate enrollment? So this pie chart here shows you a slice uh, of, of AU's enrollment relative to, um, uh, to where, where, where we're at for each, each year. So this year, um, we're, we're expecting to welcome about 1,700 1, new students. Um, as, and this is as official registration numbers, which will increase over the coming weeks as there's always late stragglers. Um, students who were new last year, it's about 1,500 students that, that, we, that we will expect to see in the classroom. Students that started uh, two years ago, around just under 1,700 students. And then students that started in fall of 2021. So you may remember that was a really large uh, post-COVID class. Um, so we're, we're, we have just under 1,900 total students as part of that class. So in total, uh, this is uh, just right around 6,700 total undergraduate students that are registered that will be in our classrooms in the, in, over the coming year. And all of these students have different needs, different interests, desires, and goals. And it, it's each of our responsibility to help walk them through the process wherever they're at. Now, with respect to this year's incoming class, um, you know, who can we expect to welcome? Um, so this is specifically to our, our first year student population. So we have about 1,740 new first year students that we can expect to welcome. Um, you may recall your own first days of college when you stepped foot on your college campus, how exciting of a time that was, how eye-opening it was, all the new things you learned and experienced. Well, around 1,700 students are about to experience that for the first time through the eyes of the AU community. Now, if you're looking around the gender uh, distribution for this class, you know, AU's always been a little imbalanced uh, with gender. I, I know you all see that in your classrooms. Um, but we 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 leveled out a little bit. We're usually around 65% um, of students that identify as female. But this year, we're about 60-40 in terms of a distribution. So we, we did see a bit of an increase in our population of students that identify as male. Uh, this is an academically an accomplished class. The incoming average GPA of this year's class is a 3.78. So these are 
students that were high flyers in high school, that they ha have big ambition in the, in the academic space. And we know they will be challenged in our classrooms here, but you, you can expect to welcome students that are eager to learn, uh, that have achieved a lot during their high school years. Now, with respect to the, the racial composition of this class, this was a year of change uh, in this space because you may recall the SCOTUS ruling from last year, last summer, where they said race can no longer be a factor in consideration for college admission. Um, we felt that we were already well positioned to meet the change of the SCOTUS ruling by a, a really diverse recruitment approach where we are cultivating relationships with a lot of different student communities. Um, but you'll see here that um, um, that AU is expecting an incredibly diverse incoming class from a racial perspective. Um, and, and in fact, this is one of our most racially diverse class ever. And I think that that is a testament to the great work the university was doing in the years prior to the SCOTUS ruling to ensure that we were meeting uh, students where they were at and telling a story about the AU community that resonated broadly with a lot of students. This is also the year where we are expecting the, based on the time I've been here over the last 13 years, the largest distribution of first generation college students. So about 17% of our incoming class will be the first in their families to go to college. And I also think that this is part of a part of the redistribution of high school students in the US. We can expect to work with a more diverse group of students, a, a, a larger first generation student population and so forth. Geographically, it's always interesting to see where our students come from. Our team recruits broadly around the United States and around the world. Um, in fact, our team is about to scatter in the winds for the next few months to start recruiting the class of 2025. But this coming year, we have students from 48 of the 50 states, plus the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and 48 countries will be represented in this year's incoming class. So. From a, from a geographic perspective, there's a lot of global representation here. Um, there is a lot of representation around the United States. Now, one question that always comes up, okay, you have 48 of the 50 states. What are the two states that aren't represented? Does anyone want to guess? One for two. So North Dakota and Wyoming is the, uh, yeah, the other state. Those are two of the smallest, and they're usually usually part of uh, the mix of students that are hard to capture. Uh, really thinking about a scholarship program for, for those North Dakotans. You know, we really like to say we have all 50 here. Uh, you know, that's one way to get them in the door. I'm just kidding. And then distribution by um, academic interests. So you see here, um, ne nearly a third of the class is in the College of Arts and Sciences. 20% are coming in through the School of International Service. Um, COGOD is about 13% of the class. Um, SPA leading the pack, again, about a third. See you there, Saul, good luck. 8% um, SOC, uh, the mighty SOE um, clocking in at 1%. And then about 8% of our students are undeclared, uh, meaning that they, they haven't made a distinction yet. And, one of one of our tasks over the coming years is to help these students find an academic home. And we have an excellent program to to make that happen through an advising perspective and how we showcase our academic offerings here. So you do see uh, a, a unique distribution of academic interest from our incoming class. And this is always interesting, too. We really don't consider legacy admissions in our process. It's not something that drives our application review. But it's always interesting to note after the fact, hey, what percent of incoming students have a formal affiliation to the AU community as a legacy student? And this year is about 5% of our incoming class has a legacy affiliation. I also wanted to share some other fun facts before I turn it back over to Ashley to go through her portion of the presentation. But one of the things I always find fascinating is names. Uh, you know, who can we expect from a name to come in? But there are two uh, two names that we that are tied for the most you know most common name in this year's incoming class. A anyone want to guess? Uh, excellent guesses. So we have sixteen Avas coming in, and sixteen Sophias coming in, and they were tied. But I'll give you the list of the other ones. So we have twelve Ellas, we have twelve Hannahs, we have twelve Isabellas, we have twelve Mayas. 
we have 11 Benjamins, 11 Graces, 11 Matthews, and 11 Samuels. So if you shout one of those names, there's a good chance someone will turn around and say, hey, what's going on? What do you want? One of the things we're also keenly focused on here at AU is affordability. And we know our students come from a range of, of um, family circumstances that find themselves here. Um, I always look at uh, of students who file for financial aid, what is average income for these families, but the average income for this year's incoming class is $210,000. It's quite high. Uh, a lot of our students come from a place of privilege and resource, um, but the middle 50% of income, so if you look at uh, students, so 25% of students ha have above this highest number I'm going to share, and 25% of students have below the lowest number for, for an average family income. So the the 25th percentile for average income is about $67,000. And the high end, so the, the 75th percentile is about $270,000. So it really gives you a sense of the range of where our students are coming from, at least from a resource perspective uh, that their families are, are you know, bringing with them. Also high school representation. This is something that our office is really focused on. Like what high schools do our students come from? So. Um, we have over 1,300 different high schools represented in this year's incoming class. So there are a lot of students coming from a lot of different high schools. There were 281 high schools that are sending more than one student to AU. So they have a classmate that, that they were with in high school at 281 high schools. There are 27 high schools that are sending four or more high schools to AU. And does anyone want to guess who's leading the pack with nine students coming from their high school this year? That's a good guess. So it's Bethesda Chevy Chase High School. Yeah, you're like, that was going to be my guess. So um, there, there will be nine students from that one high school up the road that will be part of this year's incoming class. This is a brief snapshot of our class by the numbers. Um, I know all of you will begin to build an excellent relationship with these students in the in the coming uh, over the coming year, and you will get them you will get to know them on a much deeper and personal level. Um, but this is meant to give you a big picture of who you can expect to greet over the coming weeks. I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to turn it over to Ashley, who's going to give you much more insightful information. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. All right, and so I wanna start by connecting the dots from the keynote presentation that we witnessed yesterday. So we just talked about enrollment, right? And what that picture looks like. Guess what I'm getting ready to talk about next? Retention, that's right. And folks in the chat, please feel free to jump in because this is a very important part of the conversation. We do all this work to get the students here. We make an investment to get these students to come to AU, they are making an investment to come to AU. And so with that in mind, we owe it to these students, right? To do as much as we possibly can, not just to make sure that we are their community, that we're their home away from home, but to make sure that when, and I really do mean when bumps happen, right? Whether they're the little bumps that we ride around in the neighborhoods and hit and you can keep it going, or literally something is in the road and somebody needs to move it out the way, that's what we need to be thinking about for our students. Because as we look at the diversity, as we look at the backgrounds of our students, as we look at their successes, when they come to AU, a new chapter begins. And we wanna make sure that we are ready for them. And because I can, say for the most part, some of them are not quite ready for us. And that looks different depending on the student. And so I wanna give you all a landscape of where we are with our retention efforts at the high level. We're gonna start macro and we're gonna get micro as we talk more and more about our students and what they're seeing, what they're experiencing and also what they're feeling because all of that is very, very important. And it goes beyond just these numbers. So when you're looking at this, specifically the dark blue bars, right? That is our one year retention. If you're looking at these numbers at the bottom, the years specifically, those are entering classes, right? So entering a fall 2023, entering fall 2022. So when you see these blue bars historically for the past 10 years, we've been in the eighties with one exception. Do you all see what that exception is? 2020, right? I know you all have maybe heard me talk about this before, 
But there are two sides of that pandemic story, right? There are the ones that flee, <laughs> just get me out of here. And then there's the ones that stay and want to know like what's happening. I'm not ready to take a gamble at that moment. So for the sake of this conversation, we're going to put 2020 just in a parking lot. We can always come back to it, of course, to learn about the best practices that we not only implemented, but continued. Uh, but realistically, we're in a position now where we need to be thinking about how do we get out of the 80s the high 80s, mid 80s, and to 90%. And we are capable of doing that as a university because we are so close and because we are so dedicated. When I first started in February of 2023, the first thing that I witnessed was amazing programs, amazing resources, all of these things that are ready to be packaged for students to utilize. And where we can help them is the timing, right? We do a really great job of letting them know all of those things up front for the most part, but then what happens when they actually need it? Do they remember? Are they ready to use it? Are they engaged? Do they feel like someone in that space cares about them? All of those are the secret pieces that are happening behind the scenes with this retention rate. And so we really do want to move in a direction where we're getting closer and closer and beyond that 90%, but sustain it so that it's not just 2020. When we look at the red bars down at the bottom of the screen, that's our second year retention rate. So when you think about our sophomores that are rising to their junior year, you can see even more melt and attrition that happens at this particular stage. So when I show this slide, I say this because when we talk about retention, many of our minds go to that first year class. But the reality is it doesn't stop there, right? We need to be working just as hard, if not harder, for our sophomore populations, our juniors, and then ultimately our seniors to get them to cross that finish line. I'm happy to report that if we look at our first year students and the efforts that we've put in place throughout the last year, which involves everybody, every single person on this campus has a role in student success, has a role in retention. And so far, while these numbers are not locked in stone, if you look at the yellow bars, we have an 87.9% uh, registration rate, which is an early indicator for retention. This time last year, it was 86.4. So we are on the rise, folks, when it comes to our first year retention. And so I'm hoping to see, you know, some celebrations for that because we really, we're seeing the fruits of our labor and we want to see that continue. When we talk about the sophomore level though, right, we're kind of going in the wrong direction. But that's okay because you have to start somewhere, right? And so with a strong first year retention rate, and again, having us talk about, well, what does the sophomore experience look like? What does it look like for a junior? We can continue to keep these numbers as a trend moving in the positive direction. So I hope that that gives you just a quick sense of where we are with retention. Where we are with our graduation rates, we are on the rebound, okay? So when you look at that red bar, that's our four year graduation rate history. So a lot of 70s, mid 70% 70 ranges started to lower a little bit around 2017. And then in 2018, 2019, and more recently now 2020, even though that's not locked in stone, we are now in the 60s, folks. So what does that mean? One, I see that we did something to get us in a direction, right, at one point for that 75% range for a year. So what, what did we do? How do we study, right, that type of work so that way we can come back to that? We're already in the midst. You can see it started to go like this. I know folks probably online might not be able to see my hands and visuals here, but we are on the rebound. So you can start to see some of those numbers go up as it relates to our four-year as well as five-year. With six year, again, it's similar to that first year retention rate. You have to start with the base, right? You have to start with a strong base, otherwise it continues to melt off over time. So if we can get our four year up and our five year up, right? It will only happen naturally, even though we've been pretty flat with our six year, we're hoping that we can continue to move that beyond the 80% range as well. So that's where we are with our retention and graduation. But let's get into the weeds, right? And I'm gonna pull these all up on the screen to start. When we have our students come and matriculate, they've been on campus for three to five weeks, we send them a survey. There's actually three surveys that go out throughout the year, specifically to get at the student's transition, their experience. And those surveys happen in the summer, the fall, and the spring. 
And those, are, those surveys allow us to study the change of our students' feelings, behaviors, experiences, but also more importantly, needs, so we can be actionable with that data. So what you're seeing now is the synopsis of this data that we've pulled from both 2022 as well as 2023. And the red numbers that you're seeing are students that are answering very or extremely as it relates to that large question of, is AU a place that you belong? So we see 66% say that they can see a bright future for themselves at AU. 59% have someone at AU that cares about them, which we know is extremely important. 39%, being an AU student means a lot to me. 46%, my experience with AU aligns with how AU promotes itself. So when you think about these numbers, right, in isolation, what, what do they mean? When we start to layer on the other side of the equation, it gives us two stories that we can start to study. The students that are coming in and saying, yes, this is the place that I belong, essentially. I feel like I'm in a good place, not just to be successful at AU, but to stay at AU and graduate. There are students that are already coming in again in those three to five week frames that are starting to say, and those numbers in parentheses, that they don't necessarily see a bright future, that they don't have someone that cares about them. Maybe it doesn't mean as much to them, right, to be an AU student. Um, and of course, with po politics and all the things that are happening and, and AU is a place for change makers to be, it's extremely important for this place to align, right, with the goals that these students have um, and how AU promotes itself. So with those two sides of the coin, again, we have opportunities to understand why that is. And we don't just leave it that way, right? We really wanna dig in. Because if we don't, what ends up happening is the other side of the study. And it's why are students leaving? Or why do students feel like they might leave? And you can see these numbers break down in a different way where most of our students, quite frankly, just want a different social environment. And when you dig deeper into that, you start to understand the complexities of what that means. It means friends, it means fun. It means having someone again that cares about you, whether it's an adult or another peer. I think all of those things are very, very important and we're seeing that opportunity um, really stand out for our students. I'm hearing that more and more. When you see the different academic experience, that also breaks down in a number of different ways. Some students, while it's only a third, some of those want, uh, a more challenging environment, a less challenging environment. And all of that is valid, right? I think we still need to understand why that might be. Some DC is just not for them. And that also is okay. Some say, well, this wasn't the DC that I thought it was, <laughs> right? Let's be honest. Some really wanna be in the thick of that action. And so while again, we get these answers and these responses, we like to dig deeper just to understand, well, what does that mean for you? And what were you actually looking for? Some are homesick. They just wanna go home. Financial issues. So a third of our students at the front end are already telling us that this is going to be a concern for them. We see this number start to rise as they move beyond their first year. But the reality is sometimes we put this first when the social piece is actually first. And we'll talk about why that is when we think about value proposition. Yes, finances are very much so real, but if you can make it worth it, <laughs> that takes out a, a portion that we're kind of on the fence, right? And so we really need to be thinking about that value proposition to encourage the students that can stay to stay. So how does this change? That was fall, this is summer. And now we're talking about the incoming class of 2024, fall 2024. So in our summer transition survey, we are seeing higher rates than we have before, which is extremely great news, right? But before I get into it, I want us to remember that picture that I just shared before. There's something that happens in that three to five week period. So these students are coming in bright eyed and bushy tailed, right? Over the summer, very excited to see us. You can see that 90% of them are excited to come. 86% of them are confident in their decision. They know that AU was their first choice. 81% already feel welcome in AU. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> That's kudos to you all here and admissions. And uh, a number that's going in the other direction, which is good for us, which is that anxiety about college, right? And we know that that starts to build up over the summer. And so that's less this year when we think about wellness and mental health, some of the lessons that we learned yesterday, that's very, very important. 
So we have to keep it here, right? We don't want it within three to five weeks to reduce and have students questioning whether or not they see their future here at AU. Academically and socially, we see even the same trends, right? Students are thinking that this is gonna be a very good fit for them academically, a good fit for them socially. And then also they're already anticipating how they will be included at AU to a point where they say, I, I think I'm already gonna feel included. And that's amazing, right? Before you even step foot on campus to have 73% of your class already feel that way, that says something. So I'm sharing this as a message of optimism that our students are coming in with the energy and we need to meet them halfway, which many of us do. And our work with the student thriving and retention action team, the work that you're doing in your committees, this event, all the things that we do that rejuvenate us and that get us ready for this busy, busy school year, remember that our students are reading off of that energy. They're feeding off of it, right? In many cases, when they're in front of you, their energy, because of whatever issue they might have encountered, could be low. It's on us to get that back up again and, and allow them to see the possibilities, especially if we can remove, like I mentioned, some of those bumps or barriers out of their way. So what does this boil down to? Why do students stay at AU? It should shock no one, right, that we have an excellent reputation. We have an excellent history and legacy that we need to continue to uphold here at AU. Our, while some students say DC is not for them, the majority of them say it is. This is exactly where I wanna be. And with this year and the election, that says even more. They wanna be in the heat of the action. And so as you all are having your conversations with students, asking them how they're doing, incorporate civic discussions into that, right? Dialogues. Have you all been able to have those hard conversations in your residence halls, in your study groups? And are there things that you want to talk about, but we just don't have the circle already set for you, right? And that's things that student affairs, student success, and other offices can certainly assist with putting in place. Strong alumni network and career, they want a job, and they want a good job, and they want a job within their area, right, of study and potential expertise. And so I think we do a great job on that as well. Scholarships. I cannot tell you how many times it has come down to a scholarship, some aid, uh, sometimes though on campus working uh, structure, you know, having them work part-time federal work study. Those are the types of things that give them that little boost as it relates to their financial confidence. So please um, continue to work with our students that identify that finances could be an issue. And let's work on that proactively so that we don't get into the second year, right? Or the third year and students are struggling. Why do students leave? So I already mentioned social environment, right? But when we look at the attrition data, what does that actually look like? 80% of our students back in 2022, and I know this is gonna change and evolve because we're thinking about scaling, but a good amount of them were not a part of any cohort whatsoever on campus. And I mean programmatic, athletic, academic. They were on their own islands to fend for themselves or to find their own community. And I know that a lot of the people that I'm working with are very much so aware of that. And so we are doing something about it. Financial concerns, we've already talked about this, right? With the value proposition. We are seeing a lot of full pay students in this bucket, this attrition bucket, leaving because, and this might be controversial to say, Transferring is a privilege, especially when we think about out of AU. You don't get the same money. You have to take a gamble in many cases on your credits, right? And so for the students that have the funds to stay, but choose to leave, what does that say, right? We need to be looking at that as much as we are looking at, and trust me, we are all in the weeds of students that don't have the finances. We meet students aid, right? And we meet their need. We're trying our best to Think about where there are circumstances where we fall short. But that conversation needs to happen at the same time that we're trying to incentivize students to also stay. High performing students. So um, many of you all know I worked at the Education Advisory Board and my friends yesterday were doing that keynote presentation. They study what's a, a, a concept called the murky middle, right? That 2.0 to 3.0 where attrition happens. I had to have the conversation that that's not quite the case at AU. We have what are called high flyers, students that have those GPAs, because again, thinking about that privilege to leave, 
you have to sometimes have that good GPA to go somewhere else and maybe get yourself a merit scholarship based on that, right? So we want to do more to attract and keep our high performing students. And this also, this last one should not surprise anyone in the room, but obviously medical issues, uh, mental health reasons, we need to be doing a better job of thinking about our on ramps and off ramps for students, because realistically, there are some students that accidentally broke their leg, right? And they just need to be gone for three weeks. What does that look like versus the student that just needs a semester off? How do we get them back on the same track, both going towards graduation? So I shared that because I try to balance this optimism versus some like, uh, this is the reality of our situation and we need to be aware of it. But the reality is when you all are having these tough conversations with students, we know success, we do, we've seen it. We have the playbook for it here at AU. In fact, how many folks know about the American.edu slash we know success webpage? Amazing, I'm seeing a lot of hands, but I'm also seeing some hands not go up at all. This website is not just a recruitment tool. This is not just a career services tool. This is a tool that we should be reminding students about on an ongoing basis so they know that first of all, $65,000 coming out of graduation, I didn't have that, <laughs> I'll be honest, right? And I know times have changed, but competitively, we are ranked very highly for that. There are some students that don't even come close to this number. And so we need to lead with that. I know Evelyn Thimba is someone who I absolutely look up to as she's reframing how we tell our story. This number has now intentionally been put front and center on that We Know Success page. So students know what that ROI is on their investment in their education. 91% of students are working already within six months of graduation. Again, that is not the case. When you look at all of our different peer institutions or competitors, I encourage you to get into those weeds because we stand out in this area. And then you can get into the weeds of where do the gra graduates land? What are they doing? Um, what other benefits are we bringing? What are those incentives? So when we talk about the value proposition, this is that slide and more. You all sitting in these seats, you all online, you are a part of that value proposition, right? Every time a student meets with you, I know some students go out of their way to meet with you. You are a part of that value proposition. So with that said, like I mentioned, we start macro, right? High rates, getting into the weeds of the surveys of um, different feelings and experiences that our students are coming in with. But now I think it's even more important for you to hear from the students themselves, right? Hear their stories, connect with their journey, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend and team member, Michael Brown, Associate Director for Student Success. Thank you. OK, can everyone hear me? All right. So I know we just had lunch and we just heard a lot of numbers. So you know, let's loosen up a little bit. If you're alive out there, say, go AU. You're alive out there, say go AU. Okay, sounds like you're alive out there. I appreciate that. <laughs> so we're gonna go right to the source today and speak to a couple of students. Um, but before uh, we do that, I did have a question that we'll kind of circle back to um, really quickly at the end. But I was interested in knowing if anyone here has any current college students um as like any children that who are college students right now or in high school on their way to college hands 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 okay so perfect so a, a few a handful so i want you to think about um while we're talking with the students today i want you to kind of think about as the privilege of not being a first generation student not having to be a first generation student what would you what advice would you give them about college in this day and age right now? Like if it were today, what's the first thing that kind of comes to mind that you would want to express or share with them about what they could expect from their college experience? 
So just keep that in mind to let it simmer while we are having this conversation. Um, but I did have a couple of students here who were who was so kind to um, participate today. And um, online, um, we currently have Caroline, and she'll be speaking with us today. And in person, we have Sierra. They will share their um, their programs with us and a bit more in their year with us. But in addition to that, a bit more information as we go along. So, um, Sierra, if you don't mind sharing um, your program and year, and then we can get started with a few questions. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. So, hi everyone, I'm Sierra, I'm a rising senior. I'm a biology major with a minor in public health. Uh, and so I'm part of the College of Arts and Sciences. Perfect, thank you. Woo, okay, look, we can clap for that. <laughs> so, Sierra, I have a my first question for you is, what was the deciding factor, if any, that kind of put AU over the top for you? Yeah, so I decided to go to AU uh, because it's of its location, uh, because I really wanted to go abroad and we're ranked really highly for our abroad program. I went to Kenya this past semester, so I did that. It was great. Um, and then also I got an academic scholarship, so that made it feasible for me to come here. Awesome. Yeah. Did you know anyone um, that had gone or attended to AU beforehand? Nope. That's awesome to hear. I kind of love that. Okay, so Caroline, same question to you. If you can hear, can you hear me, Caroline? Yep. Perfect. I got you. <laughs> it's like the voice in the sky. Um, what was the what was the deciding factor, if any, that put AU over the top for you? Yeah, absolutely. Same um, kind of idea as Sierra, but um, like I'm from the Midwest, so it's very popular out here to uh, go to a Big Ten school. Um, but I chose to attend AU because of the size. Um, I really wanted that hands on engagement, the opportunity to have that connection with faculty, with other students, um, and also certainly the location. Um, and I think I really wanted to choose an institution that has a commitment to public service um, as that is uh, aligns with my career and academic goals. So I would say certainly those um, those two were that were my main things. Awesome. Thank you, Caroline. You said you're from the Midwest. Me too. Where are you from? Oh, awesome. I'm from the Chicago suburbs. I'm from Chicago too. Oh, so moved here a year and a half ago. So I just want to throw that out there. I see you, Shy Town. I just knew it. I felt it. Um, oh yeah, go Cubs! Oh, I didn't say all that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so back to you, Sierra. What would you consider your biggest success so far at AU? So I would say my biggest success would be my time abroad. So while I was in uh, Nairobi, I was able to uh, take control of the Instagram that we had there. Uh, and that wasn't really a position they had in the past. I just kind of asked for it and they were like, sure. Um, and so I really raised engagement. I got a lot of people involved and they have a problem with getting enough people to go to Nairobi because it's, I don't know, people think it's kind of scary. You're going to across the world. It's an eight hour time difference. Uh, but their summer session had a bunch of kids. And so I felt as though that was that was something really cool. I was able to show people uh, the place that I loved so much. Uh, and also while I was there, I was able to raise money because there were some devastating floods there. You might have seen them on the news this spring. Um, and then I was able to get that money um, to someone who knew who needed it the most, a, a local woman who I was friends with. Um, and so I, I felt like it was just an incredible experience. And that was my biggest success here. Awesome. Thank you for that. That's one of my biggest regrets about undergrad is not traveling abroad. And I always wanted to do it. And I just didn't think I would be able to make it work. And unfortunately, like there weren't there weren't a lot of people around me who talked to talk to me about why the, why you could make it work and how a lot of people make it work and you're no no different, you know, from that. And so I love to hear that too. Yeah, actually, uh, just to build off that, yeah. um, as a biology major, it's actually incredibly difficult for us to go abroad. You'll It's rare to find a biology major who's able to go abroad. Um, my advisor did say, um, you probably won't be able to go abroad. Uh, he didn't advise anyone to take three lab classes in a semester. Um, but I, in fact, took three lab classes in a semester for three semesters and went abroad. So it wasn't easy to get there. But um, I would say with enough guidance that we have here at AU, you can make it possible. 
That's, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and share that with your friends as well, um, in case they ever want to come to AU and have them speak to us. So that's really good to hear, and I appreciate that. Um, Caroline, same question to you. What do you consider to be your biggest success at AU so far? Um, that's a great question because I feel like it's definitely, um, there could be more than one answer for that, but I would say, um, at AU specifically, I'm a part of the complex problems program. So I'm a program leader. I'm a senior program leader. It's my fourth semester, um, in the program. And that has, um, just led me to a lot of great opportunities connecting with students and faculty, um, and really kind of seeing what it takes to support um, the freshmen in those seminars. Uh, and that's been an incredibly rewarding experience, uh, which beyond beyond that, it has given me the courage and inspiration to um, seek outside internships. Uh, it's something that I talk about in my um, interviews. And so I would say that that has been a major stepping stone for me. Shout out to the Complex Problems Program um, and specifically Riley and Rebecca, um, who mostly have uh, run the show over there as long as I've been a part of it. Um, and it's it's really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we love a shout out here. You know, we do love that. So thank you, Caroline. Um, so everything isn't going to be perfect, right? We're none of us are perfect. AU isn't going to be perfect. And so the question that I do have for you now, Sierra, is what was one of your, let's say, biggest hurdles at AU and how did you overcome that? Yeah, so, I mean, we just had this whole great presentation about retention um, and us students, we have something that we call the AU urge to transfer. And I know a lot of people who consider transferring and uh, my freshman year, I filled out an application to transfer to Tulane. I was like, this isn't the place for me. Uh, and my mom said, just give it one more semester, uh, see what you can do. Uh, and so I ended up going through uh, formal recruitment spring semester of my freshman year. I never thought in a million years that I'd be a sorority girl. That was never me. Um, but uh, the sororities here, they're more philanthropy focused than anything I'd ever seen on social media or anything. Um, and I really, I found my community there uh, because before that I was just feeling lonely. Um, and I think the social thing is just huge here. Uh, so yeah, I was able to find my community there. I've been on executive board for several years now, um, and I just love it. And now I, I love where I am in my community and the friends that I have. Uh, but I would say that first year was definitely pretty hard. Um, I think a lot of people can relate to that, especially within their first year. Um, and students typically, a lot of times when they are having that urge to transfer at some point, they try to do, they try to do so before that sophomore year is out. And so you'll see it a lot of institutions that will sophomore year rates kind of go quite low sometimes because that's when students make that final decision to have all their trans their credits transferred into somewhere else. Um, and I was in that same boat my freshman year. I had filled out an application to another school. I'd actually gotten accepted. I had gone to the financial aid office. I had done all the due diligence. And what brought me back to my undergraduate school was the literal um, group that I was a part of on campus. And they were they would text me throughout the summer like, I can't believe you're not coming back. And I felt like I already missed having that sense of belonging and community on that campus that I literally went back. I canceled all those plans and went back to my university. And so it's it's interesting to kind of hear that. So I can appreciate that. Um, Caroline first, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Can you hear me, Caroline? Um, yes, it looks like I am stopped from starting my video, but I can hear you okay. And hopefully you guys can still hear me. All right, there you. we go. How okay, yeah. Um, at AU and how do you feel you overcome you had overcome it yeah so uh similarly to Sierra um I think it's the case for every college freshman the social landscape of um such a new place can be uh very challenging that's a very hard thing to navigate um and I think it really took uh for me at least stepping out of my comfort zone uh getting involved in um, a club at AU called Students for a Just Society. It's a criminal justice-based organization. Um, so I think definitely that was a hurdle to overcome, kind of like finding my people and also finding folks who um, also align with my interests, because I think uh, for a lot of students at AU, that is also a priority. 
So um, I would say uh, just really getting involved helped me conquer that social hurdle. Awesome. Yeah, no, that social aspect, especially now more than ever after COVID, it was even difficult for me to kind of adjust back into that social atmosphere and feel comfortable in it. Um, I didn't know how to even perceive myself sometimes because I didn't know what people's like limitations were as far as proximity. You don't know like so you and you also want to keep yourself and others around you healthy, um, et cetera. And it kind of really threw things out of whack. And a lot of people have been um, very virtual um, and anyone who has I have nephews and they literally on a tablet all day if you let them. Um, they do not go outside and play like that anymore. And I used to like climb trees and everything. And my nephew, if I ask him to climb a tree, he'll look at me like I'm crazy. And he'll also wonder why he would want him, I would want him to get his hands dirty, which is really weird. I used to make mud pies. Like, I don't understand, but I know. <laughs> and so it's a different type of generation. I think it's also that speaks to the ebbs and flows, which is one of the reasons why I made it so specific about asking, what would you, suggest to the co the current college student today earlier so hopefully you're still thinking about that because we're only a couple minutes from getting an answer from a couple of you hopefully um but i did have one more question um for the students that we have here today um how would you describe ways au has prepared you for the future that you want to pursue yeah i think it's got me really well prepared um the uh, College of Arts and Sciences, uh, it's a growing program, so they're really pushing, uh, helping students out individually. The faculty is just fantastic over there. Um, so I was able to get into a research lab my freshman year, uh, and then that summer after my freshman year, uh, the, the Career Center helped me get an internship. Uh, so I was out the gate running, um, and now I've had several internships, and I know that the career center's there. If I need me, I have meetings with people all the time there. They're just so helpful. Um, and I have mentors now and just people who are, who are great help. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the job hunt, but I'm not super worried. I think it's going to be all right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First of all, let's just throw it out there. It's a huge, um, blessing to not really worry about the job, you know, like not have to worry about what that's going to look like afterwards. I think that is um, a huge success story just in itself. Um, feeling equipped to go out there into the real world and put those um, those tools to use, huge. And, it, and it's easy to just kind of say it, I guess, um, but I want you to really absorb this because this there's no other room in your life that's going to be like this, where you get to actually embark on this completely new um, journey after doing so much hard work that you put in yourself. You invest a lot into yourself and it's going to pay off. And so I love seeing that. Um, and Caroline, same question to you. How would you describe ways AU has prepared you for the future? Um, yeah, honestly, I think AU has pushed me to be my best self, which is overall the biggest thing that has prepared me for my future. Uh, obviously, specific connections and opportunities are important, which I've been fortunate um, to find uh, a bit of that, quite a bit of that in the School of Public Affairs. Um, and I would say that the professional skills that I've developed um, through being in leadership positions, through being given the chance to take on very challenging projects, um, and also just the space uh, from faculty um, and other students um, at AU to kind of explore um, my interests, uh, where I wanna end up, I would say um, that has been um, the best way that, I've been able to, I guess, develop my skills um, and just come across a lot of opportunities. So I would say um, just like really the environment at AU is conducive to success. Um, and I think that there are a lot of students uh, who are a testament to that. Thank you for that. Oh. Sophia, can you hear me? So, oh, um, we were just hi, yeah. <laughs> Sophia, hey. did you know that you have the most popular name at AU? Oh, that I have the most popular name at AU, the Sophia and the Hamilton. 
it comes yeah it's not the first time <laughs> my name is michael brown I <laughs> yeah i can only imagine i totally get it well i'm gonna um i'm gonna throw out a couple of questions for you um and i want you to just kind of you know i i it'll be pretty much the same format that we had discussed before um sure. but couple of things I wanted to know um, we're interested in knowing what was your deciding factor um, that put AU over the top for you I think Sierra and Caroline said it the best when they said the study abroad program and our professors are like as long as we're doing shout outs Krista Tuomi everybody at the AU abroad department I'm talking Abby Matthew everybody over there unbelievable unbelievable people that just like they really motivate you it's crazy <laughs> and then what would you consider your biggest success so far at AU then oh um well I wouldn't say it's my own success but I would say I think it's a success of the SIS school something that I have always always pushed for and always longed for while studying at SIS is our community and we have been working on our community initiatives which um, are our like thematic areas so I am the student advisor um, very proudly for the politics governance and economics um, student cohort it's kind of house Thing that's going on over there um and I'm really excited because I basically get to but like collaborate with a bunch of professors and a bunch of other clubs and organizations at the school to figure out a bunch of people to go and take them on cool field trips in DC because the best part about living in DC is all of the events the festivals the free food the music it's insane no, I've been enjoying it myself. I completely agree with you. And I'm a huge festival person. So yeah. it definitely helps to have those things outside of campus too, to kind of bring you into a more sense of community on campus. So I love to hear that. Um, what would you say is your biggest hurdle at AU? And how do you feel you overcame that? Oh, well, it's, it's, um, it's a, it's an everyday challenge, you know, and that's just, communication barriers sometimes like communication styles go crazy and you're like what's going on and um everything's very confusing but at the end of the day if there's one thing I know about AU and the people that work at AU is that there are enough people that are working in the offices that you're having trouble at that will care for you so deeply <laughs> that will make sure that you are okay during like all of whatever struggles you're doing or any questions that you have really 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 supportive staff members yeah and then um how would you describe ways AU has prepared you for the future Oh, well, we're going to find out. Um, but I would say through my study abroad opportunities, I have been able to explore more about what I'm looking to do with my future. Um, while I haven't done that many internships while I'm in D.C., um, which is crazy, controversial take, totally OK to do while you're in D.C. Um, but there is a um, a lot that's been able, like a lot of people that have been able to share with me their networks abroad, um, specifically while I did the summer abroad internship while I was in Brussels, I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to work on supply chains and trade issues and like a bunch of economic stuff. Who would think I would like economics? Um, personally, I didn't growing up, so. Understandable. <laughs> Definitely appreciate you sharing those anecdotes with us because it's very important to kind of hear um, from, again, from the source, um, exactly what makes you thrive here. And that's part of our office. It's literally in the name, um, is student thriving. And it's not just about students getting along to get along or students kind of making it. It's students thriving. And so it's part of our job to make sure that that's continuing to be the case um, from start to finish. And not everything, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, not everything is going to be perfect anywhere. But the best part about our job is making it worth it, as Ashley said before, making it worth it. They're not just students. They are customers. 
that are paying a pretty penny to for a service, um, and not just for a degree. Um, but they are, in addition to students and customers, they are also people. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind that there's always needs to be a human aspect first um, when making efforts for student success. So I really want to thank the student panel so much for participating today. And I have not forgotten about my question. So can I get a parent up here who may want to offer a one bit of advice to students who may be in the college climate or entering the college climate soon. Anyone want to volunteer as tribute? Bridget, I'm seeing, I'm seeing it. I see you. <laughs> it, okay, I'm going once. Help the kids, people. Help the kids. Yay, Dara, come on down. <laughs> My worst nightmare, but. Um... <laughs> All right, uh, with trepidation, I have a junior going to Greece, just got his visa, thank the Lord, uh, and an incoming first year student. So um, I'm in the thick of it, and they're both here. So uh, thank you, tuition and remission. Um, my advice to my kids has been, A, I'm not going to help you. I'm not going to do it for you. You do it. You ask me questions. You do it. You do it. You do it. That's why yesterday he got his visa. Okay. Um, and my kids are lovingly wonderful, dynamic, average people. They are not starting a nonprofit. They are not the ones who have like had six internships already. And they don't want a triple major. They want to have fun. And so that's my uh, type of child. And my advice to them has been, you're going to learn. That is your job. But the most important learning you're going to do is about yourself. So reflect, reflect, reflect. Pay attention to your body, your mind, your spirit, and learn about yourself. Wow, mic drop. That was really good. Thank you so much. OK, so we do have a few minutes um, if anyone had any questions um, for us or the student panel. Come on down. Yeah, I'm on. I think for Sierra and Caroline, I, you both thought about, or you both mentioned struggles in your first year. How can we as staff support your social engagement? Because I don't think you want us being like, go there to make friends or let me introduce you to so-and-so. Maybe you do. I don't know. But like, if that's where clearly the data and your perspectives are telling us that that's a struggle. So how can we all help in that, in that realm? Caroline or Sophia or Sierra? Um, I can hop in first really quick. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think it's very tough uh, to kind of support that. But what I've found is when faculty have connected me with organizations like that have people that might be like minded, like that, I think as a faculty member might be the best way to connect someone socially. Um, and also just like promoting if the course is conducive to it, promoting that group work. Uh, I'm sure Sophia and Sierra might say they've made some very good friends in their classes, just sitting next to folks. So just like providing opportunities for connection, I would say is the biggest thing. Definitely jumping off of that, providing community. Um, one of my favorite things that my professor um, at the SIS does, uh, Krista, she will kind of force me to go and find my friends, even if they're not in my class, or she'll go and tell me to go and sit in her class and gather the students that might be interested to go to one event. Like there's late nights at the art museum that are free. Um, the Dia de los Muertos one is my favorite. Um, getting students, just getting them kind of making your own like group within your classes can really, really, really help. And it's not in, like exclusive in any way because it's just the class. Interesting, thank you, Sophia. 
Yeah, I would. That's a great question. Um, I would definitely agree with uh, what both of them said. Uh, I know my freshman year, I had some professors who had a assignment where you had to do a short introduction about yourself. Uh, and in response to it, um, one of them was like, oh, you like the outdoors. Have you considered joining the AU Outdoors Club, which is super cool. And I, you know, I didn't know it existed because uh, I was a freshman and I didn't know anything, but that helped. Um, and then also, again, only if the, the class is conducive to it, but I had another professor, um, shout out Professor Tudge, because uh, uh, we're doing shout outs. Um, <laughs> He did, um, occasionally he would do group quizzes. So you wouldn't, you would study as if it was a normal quiz. And then just occasionally he'd be like, okay, it's a group quiz. You can work with whoever's next to you. And that, that bonds you like no other. If you're, you're both trying to get that A and you're next to each other, it was really, um, I met some really fun people in that first class and we're friends to this day. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, do we have, we have about maybe four, three or four more minutes. Um, so maybe time for one more question if anyone had any. Anyone? Any? Oh yeah, online. Anyone online have any questions? Next late night is September twenty eighth. FYI. Oh, of course. First page. Hang on. I think this works now. Yeah, I have a couple of questions from the online audience. Uh, so it's related to the data you presented earlier, Ashley. Uh, so now Kowalski would like to know if we have any any numbers in terms of how many of our incoming students are identifying as LGBTQIA+. Um, and then another related question is, what was the response rate for the, uh, the campus uh, climate survey? Yes, so I'll start with this, the second question. Uh, response rate. So for the fall, it's uh, approximately 68% for that particular survey. Um, but over the summer, for the summer transition survey, we had over 90% of students complete that. So very proud of that effort. We're going to continue to get those response rates up. Um, but in terms of LGBTQ numbers, I actually would defer to our um, Center for Diversity and Inclusion. And I don't see Robin or Corey in the room, but that's something we can definitely circle back on and see what we have and if we need to build a better infrastructure to collect it. Perfect. All right. Well, um, we are right at about time, it looks like. Um, so thank you so much. I want to give another thank you again to the student panel, if we can give them a hand. They're going to be doing great things, and we appreciate you all being so engaging today. Um, Feel free, I, think, I believe there's still things out in the hallway um, that may be left, so please also feel free to do that. Thank you all. <laughs>